That sounds great. Thanks, Christine. So welcome everybody to this week's collective learning meeting. Please remember to mute your mics unless you want to ask a question. Uh, please feel free to use the chat box and introduce yourselves in the chat box. If you type a question in the chat, I can ask the question for you. My name is Christine Tang. Today's date is Friday, April 24th, and our presenters today are Drs. Lindsay Zimmerman and Tom Rust, who will be presenting about Modeling to Learn, a national quality improvement initiative in the Veterans Health Administration. Take it away, Lindsay. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, and thank you, Tom, for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Um, so this is our roadmap for what we want to do today. We got some coaching from Dean about what the group might be interested in. And so we thought walking through as the abstract that Christine circulated said, how we've tried to make this still be participatory system dynamics learning at scale um, through a variety of decisions we've made all along the way in the development. Um, we thought that might be an interesting thing to walk through with the group and think through and hear what you guys are thinking about. Um, and so this is what we planned and we'll kind of pull in some links and point you to things as we go. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll know what we mean when we say uh, we have this tagline, test, don't guess for our modeling to learn program. Anything else you want to say, Tom? Uh, just that we really want to make this as interactive as possible. So when you have questions, just say your name and jump on in. Uh, yeah, and I'm excited to share uh, all the work that we've been doing with everyone. Thanks, Tom. Great point. Uh, please do just speak up and forgive me. I'm driving sort of a couple new platforms for myself, not Zoom, but this Lucid chart. So we'll just see how we get it. So um, first of all, what was our modeling problem? Well, when we first got started with modeling to learn, we were really trying to understand what was causing the limited reach of a variety of evidence-based practices, psychotherapies and pharmacotherapies among the addiction and mental health patient population in the United States. The VA is the only national healthcare system we have in the VA. And depending on how you slice it, um, what we were finding was that basically, uh, you know, depending on whether you say they get an EVP if they've ever gotten one visit at all, versus the definition of an evidence-based practice is actually getting a full course of care adequate to meet your need. We were saying, why are we reaching so few of our patients with our highest quality care? And again, depending on how you slice it, maybe only one out of three, we're getting some of our absolute highest quality care, which is something that is not unique to the VA, it's actually really common. So if that was our modeling problem, the question became, who are our modeling decision makers. And do you want to take this one, Tom? Yeah. So unlike uh, a lot of the problems that healthcare systems face, we found that really frontline teams are the ones who really choose her making the day-to-day -day choices about which people are getting which kinds of care. So modeling for the C-suite or for facility leadership uh, wasn't really going to solve the problem. Yeah, in fact, most of the resources we had were really developed very top down. And so something a little more bottom up um, would be the decision uh, that we needed to support, the set of decisions. So we started focusing on frontline teams and I've sort of mashed together something from Peter Huffman's 2014 Community-Based System Dynamics book and someone named Jonathan Scotcha, who's an implementation scientist. And he talks about readiness, Jonathan Scatcher does, for organizational change as being general capacities and, and specific capacities. Actually, he's got a catchy little algo, which is um, readiness for organizational change equals motivation times capacity squared. So R equals MC squared. And Peter talks a lot about how group modeling, like we wanted to do, can help with problems of learning and coordination in teams, maybe the lack of EVP access among the patient population is because stakeholders aren't learning and adapting to their situation. Maybe modeling can serve as that boundary object to get people on the same page. But also it may be the case that because they're not understanding the dynamics, the causal system dynamics, they're pursuing a bunch of strategies that are inconsistent with their local resources. 
um, and really are, are pursuing a strategy that will never work. And so if I slide over here, people getting seasick from me doing it this way. Um, <laughs> do you want to say anything about the level of aggregation, uh, Tom? So for the teams that we're working with, it's they have uh, a lot of patient level data, but they have very few resources to help them think about the, their whole panel of patients that they're managing as a team. So we like one of our very first steps was to be able to take the patient level information, sort of the one-off information that they have that's very detail oriented and turn it into something that looks at general patterns of behavior over time that apply to but that are still not so general that they're at the entire facility level, which VA also provides to people, but, but we're trying to give them something that's in the middle. Yeah, so most frontline staff think about just themselves with their patient and don't zoom out to think, how do we do better for most in our community or our clinic? Um, and at the same time, we didn't want to focus our modeling on problems that folks couldn't actually address within their own decision, you know, purview at their job. I apologize for that typo there. Do I see a question coming in? Let me just see. Can anyone see the chat? Oh, yes. Uh, Brian? I yes. Like the uh, uh, beer, beer game conversation going here with Swill, Brian. No, that's just a typo. So we were just kind of saying that we were trying to help the teams, and I'll fix that in the handout that, you, that, um, that we made. Thanks for asking. You guys don't feel shy about calling me out on my typos either. All right, so how did we get to modeling to learn live? We wanted to develop something if we were focusing on limited EBP reach as a system behavior that emerged out of team decisions, then we knew that it would be really motivating for frontline social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, nurses, to be able to get licensure credit for doing modeling. And we started with a blank sheet of paper and some very common exercises many people will know on here from Scriptopedia, from Venix and Anderson, Richardson and Anderson. We did hexagons, we did graphs over time for our original variable elicitation and, and so on. Um, and basically got to the point where we developed something that we thought could scale, which is what we'll spend most of our time talking about today. So these are all hyperlinks. If I try to click out and head to those, we can show you some of these. So we've been developing this in an iterative way and um, using open science principles. And we came up with a whole bunch of short links because again, a busy frontline clinician doesn't have any time to try to bookmark all your links or change them. So we started co-branding everything as being mtl.how. And if you don't remember anything else other than that, you can go to mtl.how and it will take you to this GitHub repository, which should give you most of what you need to access anything else we're gonna to show today. And so today we wanna to spend the bulk of our time walking through some things from our brand new Modeling to Learn 2.0 release. Um, but here at this page, you can figure out exactly which set of guides you would wanna use for the program about to explain that in about five minutes here in this overview. And you can see all of the videos of folks like Tom and I um, walking through all of the modules of modeling to learn. So this is all available at our MTL repository on GitHub. And the guides, we knew we would wanna do this all online. Uh, we it didn't need the coronavirus to, to help us realize that it was cost prohibitive to do like half day modeling workshops. So from the very beginning, like if you click on a, a middle session here, like session six, we wanted to make everything like really iterative and accessible and or incorporate feedback from the field. So you could click on a, a learner guide, for example, and we call these the C guides because a frontline staff person would see everything that they need to know in order to um, walk through that learning session and basically learn how to use system dynamics tools. So this is an example of a C guide. There's other resources as well. The facilitator guide has the facilitator C guide in it. And um, there's also things like, if I go back one more time to my folder, cheat sheets. 
texts which come out of like coding. Um, so a little one pager that you could download, print out into your cork board or your desktop or whatever. So this approach of taking um, a, and slicing up and guiding a team's use of a model into these very discrete chunks, I think is not common, right? When we initially even our team, we kicked workshop because that's sort of the norm of what we'd seen. And as soon as we started really thinking through it, we realized that those kind of modeling workshops make sense for, again, facility leadership, uh, heads of companies, that kind of thing, where they can take the time to really dive into something in one day. But for our group, there was actually our user group, there was a way that they could do that. You can't shut down a mental health clinic for a whole day. Uh, but they already have time carved out for team meetings. So we were able to sort of find the space to be able to fit the uh, learning with simulation in, uh, but it had to it had to work with their schedules on their timelines. So that's where the 12 session plan comes from, is we're able to take what would be probably a, easily a full day's worth of uh, workshop and cut it up into these 12 one hour sessions. Yeah, we didn't want to add something else on to overly burden staff. We wanted to have them swap out what they normally would be doing in a team huddle with hopefully what they see as a really big upgrade using system dynamics. So we had that vision from the beginning. It's turned out to be super critical now. And we also really wanted teams to be able to focus on their own local needs. Sorry, I was expecting to be able to highlight this, um, but I'll just click on it. So we have a an example that folks could click on to check it out. These are the kinds of links I was saying are hard to access or remember. So you can actually just go to mtl.how forward slash menu and see the red cap menu that we use to try to help a team with that early shared vision with those who are um, you know, familiar with those kinds of exercises to help help them use the modeling resources in a way that's specific to their clinic. And people just fill this out in like less than five minutes. And it's not a diagnostic that prescribes a specific model, but it does get us going about um, into a conversation or a dialogue with the team about where do they all see problems the same way? Where do they maybe really diverge from one another? Um, that sort of thing. And so we just use this to help determine which of our it's like um, modeling to learn modules or model. Each module has its own model under the hood. Um, they might need to focus on. Can I do a check about how big this is on your screen? Is this too small for people to see? Is this too big? Okay. Anyone? Uh, text is a little too small for me. Okay. Thank you for saying so. I should have asked sooner. Yeah, so you can see there's like a lot of questions here. It's like, is your highest priority learning need um, how to manage high risk patients, um, how to improve care with your existing staff, knowing staff can't just wave a magic wand and have a different set of prescribers or other things like that. So we use this to get them going. Okay, and I'll keep an eye on making sure this is big enough as we go. Thanks for the feedback. So I think this menu and the fact that we're asked asking all of these questions and, and posing and having people sort of rank all of these different possible problems and learning priorities, uh, I'm guessing is raising a lot of red flags for people on the call because now we're really deviating from sort of a main core tenant of modeling, right? We're no longer modeling just one problem for one specific group with one data set. We're trying to build a set of modeling tools that are flexible and respond to potentially any, all of these different issues that a team could be having. So that's why instead of having one model, we have five and soon six. Uh, and those individual models, uh, even those aren't designed around just answering one specific problem. Right, because the teams, the big picture here that we're trying to get to with teams is not just to help them one time come up with a set of high leverage policies, but to really try to use system dynamics modeling to help them come to consensus around their causal system structure, which they probably 
don't have yet as teams, develop some fundamental management heuristics so they're not sort of dependent on the modeling tools or the facilitators going forward and really boost the general level of systems thinking that teams have. So it's funny that you, as a system dynamicist from the WISTA program, um, mm -hmm. are thinking of it that way, from flipping it or just like slightly, maybe like 45 degrees, Part of what drew me to this as an as what's called an implementation scientist trying to you know i realized that limited reach of evps would have to be defined as a system behavior because no single person is making all the decisions that lead to whether a patient population gets to certain standards of care and so i was really from an early you know being somewhat of a programmer at least in r myself i was like oh if structure really determines this limited EVP reach behavior, then we could have generic structures where we could go through a stakeholder engagement process until we're sure that everybody says, yep, that's the boundary of the modeling problem. Those are the causal dynamics that absolutely have to be incorporated. And that could actually be generic, not necessarily the meaning of like external validity and generalizable, but genuinely like have principles of generality, like unless you account for these accumulations or these feedbacks, you'll never move the needle on this problem. And so I was like, but we could then take a standard set of parameters across our national healthcare system, and it could be the same set of data everywhere, but take on those local values of all of those teams. And that way we would be able to address um, some of the most important local differences by just reading in those unique uh, variable values. And so I think that's over here. Um, if I zoom in on this, and I think a question came in, so I'll be sure to get it in one second. We saw, for example, that like, you know, every clinic was struggling in its own way. And so we needed something that could take something, I won't like a different number of unique patients served in a year where in clinic one, they have a lower caseload per provider, even though they're sort of serving more unique individual patients, uh, which leads to fall on effects in terms of wait times. Again, you can't wave a magic wand and have a different staff mix than you have. So if you've got people who can offer prescriptions, you'll have a higher, I guess that would be clinic two that has that, more psychiatrists. So they're gonna have a higher base rate of offering medication to some of our psychotherapies and so on and so forth. But the variables that would need to be accounted for and their dynamics in terms of um, causal loops would be the same. Um, so it seemed like a really cool advantage for solving the major problem scientifically in my field of implementation science of getting people to local insights about what's causing their problems. And for me, trying to solve something in a national system, come up with a set of resources that would work everywhere. Like everyone could come up with their local insights, but using the same set of tools. Did I follow on your point? Okay, Tom? Yeah, yeah. So I think that sets up then the one of the problems that we had to solve to make this approach scalable. Yeah, so if I zoom back out to this here, um, so we've covered the 12 session plan and I think I'll go back into present mode so you guys can see this big enough. Um, around the time that Tom joined us, we had worked with David Lonsbury, who some may know, um, gave a great keynote in Albuquerque last year. Um, we started with like initial pilot work and we wrote that up. There's a link here. Um, you can Google it of like just showing that it was feasible to do modeling with frontline teams in the normal work day. And we secured a National Institute of Health grant that um, got us going trying to pilot ways of making this online and accessible at scale. And it was at that point that um, we were able to bring in Tom and some folks from his office. At the time, it was called the Veterans Engineering Resource Center and focused a lot on system engineering. And um, that's what got us to trying to turn this into digestible chunks of like the five modules of focusing on care coordination or medication or psychotherapy, um, the aggregate mix of, of care in a team, or even the handoffs across a whole continuum of care, which is the jargon here that mental health providers will know, but people on this call may not, 
which is how do you make a decision to step a patient up or down to a higher or lower level of care, say from primary care to a general mental health team to maybe a specialty program that may focus on like addiction needs or something like that. And Tom, do, should I walk through this SPC chart about what we found from, or, or are finding from the R21? <laughs> Or do you yeah, want so I, uh, I love control charts, uh, but this, this one is really cool because it shows how the approach that we used uh, as we had more and more refined models and we're spending more time using the models to learn with the team as opposed to using the team to help us build the models, how we got um, more and more sort of bang for our buck. So actually, Lindsay, I think you're going to have to refresh me about what the exact measure is. I can't quite read it. That's the EVP proportion, right? Yeah. So this was a specific one, psychotherapies um, on the y-axis. And we took on the left-hand panel, I realize it probably is a little fuzzy. So let me just, I think you can still get the takeaway. So I'll start there. Um, the upper control limit for a three sigma improvement to the green line. The red line was the pre-modeling baseline. And for seven clinics from the same regional healthcare system, um, geographically, who share the same leadership, never really got that sustained run line for the statistical process control. Their, their reach of EVPs was hovering around like 4%, which is what it was in our first clinic, which we call the PSD partner clinic because we were really just using those participatory system dynamics exercises and you know, developing a number of preliminary demonstration models and so on. But the MTL Partner Clinic 2 took off um, like crazy coming in where we had actually developed some of the stuff we're going to walk through, the simulation user interface and so forth. It made it a lot more accessible um, and a lot less future oriented, like what would you like to test if we had a simulation model <laughs> to test this in the future, which is what this clinic was doing. Um, this clinic uh, was doing a little bit more. We've developed these tools, we're still refining them, but we can use them to address some of the questions you have. And the last time these data were pulled, um, clinic one had sustained this three sigma improvement for about three years, and clinic one had sustained it, which of course in healthcare quality improvement and most change management, regression uh, is the norm. Um, and so this was at least an encouraging signal that we should uh, keep going. And the next moves over here, we sort of also realized that there was more, still yet more to do to make this accessible. Tom, uh, you were a big part of this. So do you want to say anything about it? Uh, the videos and what it was like as a system dynamicist, maybe people on the call haven't imagined getting their makeup done before they walk through their model. <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. So, so again, for our audience, like clinicians under a lot of pressure, especially the teams that we were working with are, like we're not working with teams who are performing well. That's the whole point. These are teams that are in trouble and need help. So we found that a lot of the time there would be at least one team member who couldn't make a meeting. They were they had a patient in crisis or some for some reason couldn't make a meeting. So we needed we didn't want to lose them, right? We needed a way for people to catch up. So we partnered with uh, VA Employee Education Services, who does all of the trainings for VA and does all the accreditation and everything, and went to their uh, studio, one of their studios, which happened to be in St. Louis, and recorded basically every possible session that a team could do. So if you were in you know, the medication management module in session seven, uh, and you missed it and wanted to catch back up with your team, you could spend the hour instead uh, watching the video. Yeah, so if I once again just navigate to the main repo at mtl.how, um, these are not the ones people can do for licensure credit, but um, the videos are all here. So if I grab, for example, session six of med management and just click on the link, um, you guys can get a feel uh, for what this looks like. <laughs> Oh. 
I'm Lindsay. I'm Jane. And today we're modeling to learn how to tell a system story. <laughs> so this is it. Um, I also had never anticipated as a scientist in training that I'd be having people asking me about alternative experiments against a base case while someone else was bobby pinning my hair. Um, but this really was a key you know, way to make this successful and help a whole team that's struggling move forward together. And people can get licensure credit for watching the videos, not just for any kind of online facilitation in the modeling. Um, they're short. If you can see this on the bottom, it's only like a half an hour. And they can um, you know, get credit as psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers for watching the videos and walking through as well. So that was another step. And we also benefited from some of our early grants and early work we did with uh, the Veterans Advisory Partnership for Operations and Research. And that was a group of veterans with lived experience in recovery who use VA addiction and mental health care. They helped us write our first grants. I just, again, used another shortcut, mtl.how um, videos was this one. And if you were to look at these, we have um, mapped throughout the 12 session plan little short clips of veterans telling their story. Um, it kind of adds that motivational component about, you know, for a lot of frontline staff who are overwhelmed, it's really daunting to think about using system dynamics for quality improvement. And this sort of reminds us of the original passion for why we need to improve quality of care and make sure it's a good experience for any patient. And there's a variety of other videos here, quick introductions, and um, this one, um, yeah, so I'll just mention that to you, that we worked with them uh, to develop all of these. This one is the one I was thinking of. Uh, the Vapor Introduction is a short five-minute video that explains what the veterans were hoping people would get out of this Modeling to Learn program um, and, the, and making system dynamics accessible to frontline staff. All right, so let's pick back up with where, what we figured out next got a little bit of a network lag here, so let me get it back up. So we developed that, and um, I think the next thing that we figured out uh, was we were starting to realize that if we were supporting this at national scale, then it wasn't gonna be the same. Not only was it not gonna be the C-suite, not only was it not gonna be a half-day workshop, um, all of those things that we've talked about, not only would we need a way for people to make it up if they had a clinical emergency by watching the videos, but that they would have no idea who we were unless we came up with ways for them to check us out online because we would just always be facilitating this virtually much like this call now. Um, and we also wanted a way, even though if you go to mtl.how, you can download the VENS and DSS models, um, we wanted people to have a way to check out the simulation user interface itself if they say were an events user or didn't really understand system dynamics. So we started putting together websites that would meet those goals as well. Um, one is mtl.how forward slash team. And this helps to, I think Tom, I think this website helps people get a sense of what it takes to stand up modeling at scale in a national system or you know production level models so we have we call ourselves team psd or team participatory system dynamics we have about eight work groups um, we have a series of senior scientists um, all mainly out here affiliated with stanford on the west coast a number of key partners including the veteran advisory board a number of policymakers and leaders and our employee education um, service accreditors, a number of facilitators that come from a uh, VA central office. So they do kind of come from that more C-suite level of the organization and they've all been trained to facilitate this modeling program. So if you wanted to learn a little bit more about us, who we are and what we do, here's Tom. <laughs> there you go, since I can't be on video. Yes, there you are. Um, so there's a lot of really great folks here to, you know, get to know um, through the team website. And then what we're going to spend the last half of our time kind of walking through um, is the mtl.how forward slash demo. And if you guys head to that page, we wanted to put something together, as you can see here. Um, this website supports the research effort by allowing people to play with the demonstration, even if they're, say, not within the VA with um, 
you know, access to their own clinic data or something like that. We wanted them to be able to play around with this Forio hosted, uh, Forio Epicenter hosted uh, platform, which we developed with our exceptional partner, uh, James Rollins of Praxis Analytics. Um, so he helped us put this website together as well to meet this need. And if you're seeing this and have a question um, about how you could register at mtl.health forward slash demo, you're looking for this run bar right here, this, or not bar, icon. So um, if you click on that, you'll get a little, there's like a little survey to get your password and emailed to you. So your name and email and that sort of thing. And here, this is what I wanna call out. Thank you for reminding me to do this, Tom. And thank you, James, for helping me get it set up in time. So for those who are online and interested in getting into the demo model while we walk through, you can type in down here in the course code WPI underscore 2020. Can you guys see that? Is it coming through? Let me zoom way in. Yeah, that's great. All right, so if you can type that in there, then your, your free access to this demonstration model will stay up for three months. Otherwise, it times out sooner. And is that true? Is James on the call? Is it three months still? Or did we make it longer? Uh, I think it's three months, but actually you have the ability to go into the admin panel and set a custom date if you like. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so it's a little bit outside our scope today to talk about like how we go from like um, development, to testing something, to moving something into production, and sort of what the back end admin panel works like, looks like from the team versus what we're going to show you, which is more what those out in the field using the modeling would use. But James has been really critical in helping us develop all of that on the Florida Office Center platform. Um, and so if you want to get in there, um, type in WPI underscore 2020. All right, so we, we stood those up. Um, let me zoom back out at least a little duplex here um, and close some of these high bandwidth websites like YouTube. So if you were to hop in there and register for yourself, um, there's a few other things that are probably worth pointing out here. Um, if I can get my computer to listen to me. Um, there are, for example, other links to where all the videos are. Some of the ones I've already described, like Vapor if, um, introducing modeling to learn. Um, and there's some papers and slide decks. So if you were wondering about that early, what did it take for us to get National Institute of Health funding started? When I said we did some initial piloting, um, all of that information is actually available. Um, here's the, the first paper we published on the word that sort of thing. All right, Tom, we're about halfway through, and I think we're right on time to start walking through some of what we wanted to cover next. Yeah, let's jump into the, into the sim here. Yeah, so um, for those of you who've gone uh, to demo, that's great. So one more time, that's mtl.how forward slash demo. You don't need the HTTPS uh, protocol there. And it will take you to Forio. Um, and then you'll register there. We have a shortcut for the field, which is to go to mtl.how forward slash sim. So that's what I am going to use. And, and the main difference there, right, is that if you're going through the slash sim, that's where uh, you can upload VA data directly. And there's a whole slick, uh, easy way to do that, uh, that you don't get on the demo side. The demo side uses, uh, you have just one synthetic data set. Yes, that's one of the major differences is this local data emphasis. And forgive me for one second, I want to just quickly pull up the chart that I had while we get these questions that have come through. Um, anybody help me make sure we get the questions from the chat? Oh, um, they weren't really questions, they were more of comments. And James was reminding people of what the course code was. And I'll awesome. give it to people later. Although I think there are some people on the call who might not be on the WPI mailing list, so I should add the mailing list to the chat. And thanks, Jack, as well. This is what helps us catch a whole bunch of things. So do you have audio? Can you tell me where on GitHub you're getting that um, 401 error? Can you hear me? <laughs> 
I'm shameless in finding out and catching bugs like this. So yeah, we can. Yeah, it's right near, right above the flow chart, uh, near the top of the page on mtl.how. Oh, okay. So I, let me go there. So mtl.how, you're saying that um, right here, this link? Right. Yeah, that's giving me a 404. All right. Is there anybody who wants to open a GitHub pull request from the team? Fix that. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Um, we are using GitHub as a major part of uh, supporting this at scale, and we're going to show some more features of that as we go through. Um, thank you for mentioning that. The other thing I wanted to talk about um, real quick, though, Tom, before we get into the um, SIM walkthrough, is um, we also have gotten more funding based on that preliminary research to do a much more rigorous evaluation, because as everybody knows, pilot studies are um, really notoriously noisy and they can't help you um, tease out more sophisticated questions about what might explain what you're seeing in the data. And we really wanted to do randomization. And we knew that there were sort of a couple of really important um, questions in a variety of, in some important literatures that we wanted to compare what we might find from our data user interface alone, which we've taken to calling modeling to learn red and tom did we get this convention from like you back at in grad school about the data parameters in benson being red i mean we now we say red means red in from team data but my feeling is well actually david lounsbury was doing it that way too wasn't he mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah just a nice way to keep track of uh some of the exogenous variables in your model yeah, so we're comparing, basically we're randomizing 48 healthcare systems across the country, um, across these two trials, one funded by the National Institute of Health, one by the VA, and half the sites will get the hyperlocal data user interface tools we've built, which we can't include in this video um, and webinar because um, it has to stay behind the firewall due to PHI, protected health information. Um, so we're just seeing like, is the improvement due to the hyper local data control and pulling, being able to pull in your team data, or is it really due to participatory learning from simulation? And we sort of have two potential theories of change that we're testing across the two trials. One, every system dynamicist on the call is going to be familiar with, which is that a possible mediational pathway that could explain any improvements that we find would be that we've actually genuinely increased frontline team's ability to consider complexity, feedbacks, and system behavior over time. Um, so we've actually developed um, a systems thinking code book and so forth based on John Sturman and Linda Booth Sweeney's, Sweeney's research and really have defined systems thinking as people's ability to account for complexity, feedback, and system behavior and short and long range time. But it's also true, and this is what we're testing in the other grant, that it also may be this piece that we've been talking about throughout the call today, Tom, which is that by not having any pre-baked solutions, this is not a modeling dog and pony show where the model always finds the same thing every time, no matter where you go, because you've read in some really large data set. And this is about local teams being able to read in local data to come up with insights about what's going on locally. So it could be, there's some constructs from the uh, community-based participatory research paradigm, like mutual learning, empowerment, capacity building, shared decision-making, that it doesn't have anything to do with their ability to better account for systems. It could just be that by building the tools we're about to show, people feel more engaged, take more ownership over the, the insights that they get from the modeling. So we're going to test those out over the next four years or so and, and should come up with some interesting answers for folks on the call. Anything else you want to add about that, Tom? Uh, no, we've got a question, though. Uh, what about the relationship between the two, uh, systems thinking and participatory learning? So uh, for me, I'm really hoping that that's what we find, that they have a, a sort of multiplicative effect, that just showing someone like walking someone through a generic model will be kind of effective and just 
and vice versa, doing a participatory learning process, but without stimulation will be kind of effective, but when you put the two together, I'm hoping that's where we really see the, the improvement. Yeah, I think that that's what I would expect to find as well. Um, in terms of the cluster randomized trial design and whether we could test that moderating relationship and our power to do that with the 48 healthcare systems and so forth, that might be a little bit more down the statistical analytic plan uh, lane than we want to go into for this conversation. But um, stay tuned to the space for us trying to figure that out. And I will say, since the whole theme that we decided to walk through today, based on Christine's coaching, is like, how do you scale participatory learning for modeling? Um, we obviously think that both are important. And what we were principally concerned about was losing either at scale. So losing the ability to really facilitate good systems thinking at scale or losing the ability to have people feel like it's really addressing their own local needs and problems. And so we set up these trials because they're great empirical questions to try to measure each of these constructs and the extent to which they're both going on and may explain findings. I love that question. Thank you for asking that. Any other questions before we start walking through? I think since, since it's mainly gonna be a walkthrough for the rest of our time, let me just um, say this, Tom, and then we'll kind of focus on some of the 2.0 stuff. So from the very beginning, we in our 1.0 release, we wanted people to have um, a team in an individual world. That's gonna be the first choice we make when we walk in. Uh, we wanted people to have their own sandbox for learning on their own, but we also knew we needed them to be able to save time and just quickly log in where their team was last time. So that's what we mean by having a team world. We'll show that. We knew we wanted them to have that hyper-local team data. We wanted to zoom in on modules that focused specifically on their problems and not be too aggregate and 40,000 foot view if that wasn't gonna guide their decisions. We'll show the interface for having them choose their own question, test their own dynamic hypothesis, write up what they find using their systems thinking skills and come up with new decisions. We'll talk about, again, how we make the information accessible to them and interactive, and then some of these conventions for comparing alternative experiments in the output uh, panel. So, um, this convention I talked about where red variables mean they're experimenting up or down from team data, green is your more traditional completely what if types of scenarios. Um, and then some things that we decided to do that people maybe haven't seen before, but I, I do think James, you were a particular advocate of this and I really liked it. If you want people who are novice modelers to learn system dynamics, everybody who's used Stellar or Vensum or the major competitive platforms starts often with the causal loop diagramming and learning to tell those system stories. So we didn't want to hide those dynamics. We wanted to empower people with being able to reveal the complexity of those feedbacks and explore them. And then there's some other features as well, up to and including what's called 508 compliance in the US, which means that an, an assistive reader for visually or hearing impaired or mobility impaired person could use this simulation user interface. So we'll walk through all of these. They were in the original design. And then the new features um, that we're gonna also show as we walk through are um, developing an interactive tutor that explains each feature and links out to the guides and videos, building a community of practice online where people can ask questions or share ideas and feedback, again, integrated with GitHub, and some other things that are some sort of simple, like being able to make it easy for people to report a bug, like the one that um, I've already forgotten. Jack? No. <laughs> um, like the 404 arrow you just found, so we wanted people to be able to report bugs to us. Uh, something like an on on alert, if people really saw something fatally wrong that we needed to sort of pause all learners and make sure everybody uh, waited until that was addressed. And simple things like uploading your photo so you have some online presence. All right, so let's hop to it. I was about to log in before when I remembered that we should go over those other things, Tom. <laughs> Thanks, mm -hmm. um, And yeah, it was Jack. Thanks. All right. So while, while you're logging in, um, I guess 
I wanted to maybe touch base with our audience here. So everything that Lindsay's just described is, from my point of view as a modeler, like the uh, the filling and the icing on and the, all the decorations on the cake, right? And the system dynamics model is like the the layer, like the cake layer that's in there. And I know Lindsay, you like saying your one of your phrases is you can't have tomato sauce without tomatoes. And so the system dynamics models are the, the tomatoes, but the models by themselves aren't useful, right? Just sitting locked up in Vensim, uh, we needed a way to get them out to people and to have people be able to use the, the, all of the great conventions that we've developed in system dynamics for explaining causal systems, right? Like how, we have to be able to get the diagram also to people and not just hide it away and make the model a black box. But that's pretty overwhelming, right? Every time I've tried myself to put models in front of people in conferences and things that isn't the system dynamics conference, I can see that it's totally overwhelming. So how do we do that? And so Lindsay's gonna walk through all the different ways that we've tried to make all these tools uh, that are fundamental to learning about systems thinking, how to make them accessible to people. Yeah, it's um, one of the reasons I love working with you, Tom, as well as our whole multidisciplinary team of partners is from a behavior change perspective, um, I would never describe everything we just went through as the icing and the, the filling. But <laughs> so I, you know, my metaphor, I agree. If we don't have really skilled system dynamics mod modelers and we don't have good you know, structural behavioral validity in our models, then it's, you know, for not. But it's sort of like if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? If we build really elegant models and nobody uses them, then they will have absolutely no impact in the world. And I came to modeling from a participatory mixed methods background where I was like, gosh, I could really see why you would want to be able to run through these scenarios and run sims and account for system complexity and so forth. And so I came from the participatory side to modeling, but I would say most of the people that reach out to me are people who've come from modeling and are trying to figure out how to get people to use their models. So I don't know if you'll, I don't know, how does that strike you that I would respond that way? It probably doesn't surprise you given we've worked together for a few years, but. Yeah, yeah. And one of the huge uh, learnings that I've had over this course of this project is how uh, important it is to work in teams. I mean, it seems like in grad school, everything is trying to focus you into, you know, you becoming your own expert. Um, but then if you're really trying to make change in the world, that's like, you can't stay, you know, the lone modeler trying to fix everything. You have to work with a team and you have to be able to get the models out to as many users in the real world as you can. I want to answer Eric's question about the data, and I know we only have like about 10 more minutes of our time together, so we can keep walking through features and talking about things, but I, I just want to make sure to keep that invitation open to have people hop in. Does anyone have any reactions to the exchange Tom and I just had? Because I'll tell you, attending an um, ISDC meeting um, as a psychologist, which is you know my background in training, there's a lot of folks who talk about psychological constructs and decision making and heuristics and mental models. It's really baked in the literature for 60 years of tradition. Um, but I agree with Tom that I think working in a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary team has really deepened our use of modeling as an intervention where we really are trying to create behavior change that could change systems sort of from the bottom up. So, are there any reactions that folks have to that if they want to get on the get in on the debate? Maybe it's not a debate. Okay, no one's biting yet. So let's answer Eric's question. Thank you for asking it. So will the data introduced to the model be scored or collected in some way? So why don't we show how that works, Tom? And then again, if you guys have a question that you were about to ask and that wasn't enough of a pause, we'll keep an eye on the chat. I promise to get in there and also just speak up. So from the home screen, um, this is where you would choose one of the five modules. We talked about how we use the modeling to learn menu for that. Um, 
we do in our data user interface, which again, to protect patient health information, we're not covering, but this is where you would use this add icon and upload your hyperlocal set of parameters, which our data user interface enables frontline staff to filter and select and check that data out really carefully before they upload it in the model. Because it, most people don't trust giant SQL stores of data and that it's useful to them unless they can sort of drill down, see how that charting they do all day becomes you know, data. And then they start to feel like, okay, I see where this data comes from. I know its strengths and weaknesses for guiding my decisions. So this is not available in demo, as Tom already mentioned, but it is available to the frontline staff to upload that data. And these are some of the 2.0 features that I mentioned. Every section has one of these little tutors now. This icon is up at the top as well. And if you click on it, it really is equivalent to having like someone over your shoulder showing you how to use every single feature that's here. And this again was something users told us they would really benefit from. And if you click on the video icon, it's as quick as that. It will take you to the short video that explains how to use that feature. Or if you click to the guide, it will take you directly to the C guide that shows all of those GIFs and step-by-step -step pieces for, for how to learn how to use that model. Um, and so I guess maybe the last thing I would show from this page is the report bug option. <laughs> Let me close the tutor. So like Jack did, um, we knew at scale we needed people to be able to give us bugs and submit issues and so forth. So we put that in there where you can add a screenshot and report it to us. And if you do, then we're once again using GitHub and we have these repositories. Um, Team PSD is the one for all our works in progress and all of our work groups and what they're doing. And it will immediately put that bug into a little Kanban or what we call a tracker for us to squash it. So, you know, we strive to squash any bugs in less than 24 hours. Some of them are real easy. Um, some of them are harder. Um, and so here's an example of the bug tracker and us baking this all into GitHub as a way to support things at scale. So these are current bugs that need triaging. And over here, um, you can see that since we set this up just shy of a year ago, we've closed 194 different bugs that people have found. Um, and then last, this is a slightly different thing. We wanted to support the participatory values that this developed from the very beginning. Um, and so we developed this community button where people can share ideas or, or say that they like something. And if they have a question, they can either email us or they could just quickly go see if someone has already answered it at mtl.how in the community of practice, or they could set up their GitHub account. So any of you guys can join us there if you'd like to. You'll get these little news messages um, that it's taking you out. And then you can search in here, for example, Eric asked about the data. You could type in the data UI and there's 11 different answers provided here about um, you know, the data user interface. Yeah, so besides being a way to scale, and, and so all of the users that we have won't be dependent on the few facilitators that we have, this is the way to actually have the community all learn from each other too, and keep that, you know, not only scale, but also keep the empowerment part that we were talking about before, and the participatory aspect. Totally important, Tom, yeah. For a long time, we were calling it the PLDR concept because we really have opportunities for engagement as a learner, as a researcher, since this has been a participatory researcher, as a designer, features and bugs. Um, so yeah, thank you for saying that. I'm gonna hop into the medication management module. I've already selected data. It's a data set that we've already uploaded. And I wanna answer one other dimension of Eric's question before I, you know, I don't wanna push this right up to the end, but. Um, so when we log in, every, um, learner has the same basic setup. A main section of the model diagram here, which when we're first starting out, sometimes we will hide to just build this incrementally. So just to start with, you know, what are we trying to learn? What is our question, hypothesis? How, how would we get going with that? And then we start to introduce piece by piece more and more. So I think you're asking about like if the 
um, maybe I, I should follow up and make sure, um, scored or collected the same way. Um, yes, so we're reading in the same set of parameters for every module. It'll obviously take on local values. It's all coming from the existing data store we have in VA, administrative data sets that are sort of complete data sets. Um, and when people run experiments and the model output is, um, you know, provided or produced, then yes, they can also save that, export that, and so on. We even have things called team time reports that knit this all together using our markdown and send out an email of everything they've run, everything they asked, everything they learned. Am I getting at what you were asking, Eric? Or am I missing the boat about what you're asking? Now my Zoom says someone's talking and then I see the word talking, but no, no audio. Did anyone else hear it? I didn't hear anything. Okay, all right, maybe chat if, if I'm missing the, uh, answering your question. So in here, this is how the team data gets read in. We have a number of these features. Uh, we have three kinds of eyes. So Tom, do you want to explain what this eye is? Sure, we wanted, to, so this information is also in the data user interface where they select and validate their data, but we wanted to keep everything uh, accessible to people. So these are all the data definitions uh, and descriptions of how the data are all estimated, how the parameters are all estimated from their data. Yeah, so this eye is how it's estimated. This eye, to use a Jane Branscombe, one of our facilitators, tells you what you're changing when you adjust one of the sliders. So when it says base case here for appointment supply and appointments per week, we can see up here that the appointment supply per week in this particular team is 60 appointments per week at the 75th percentile. And so if they want to adjust up or down from that base case run, they can do so with the slider. And we did talk earlier about how we have red sliders that adjust up or down from what's been going on in the team. But we also have things that, you know, we may want to experiment with just as what if scenarios, like what if we overbooked some appointments for certain types of needs like alcohol use disorder, depression, opioid use disorder, and so on. And even this feature was something we sort of had to iterate and learn the hard way. The ability to add to your lab notebook like this, um, and be able to see exactly what you're adjusting. So things like if we adjust the appointment supply, et cetera, you want to be able to both see your data, um, include Lindsay level typos on the first try, <laughs> and then record like each change that you make. And I know with the, in the interest of time, I think just to show the last pieces of interactivity, Tom, um, we have these complexity reveals. So when we introduce things for the first time, we start at just explaining like what a simple flow of appointments being booked and closed is or patients moving through care. And then we start to reveal some of the more complex feedbacks um, so that the team is never sort of overwhelmed. It's always accounting for all of these things, but these are just ways to make getting oriented to the model um, much, much simpler. And they do initialize once the data are uploaded with that local team data. So if I start toggling to view a different patient need for med management using this data file here, um, then uh, it'll just automatically adjust to show what the values are for all of those different things. And I think the last thing, if I wanted to show the last view we haven't shown was we kind of wrap up. We also have this feature, which is to pull up any prior experiment and you can see exactly what values were adjusted uh, for that last experiment. And to save time, you can just include your lab notebook of everything that you recorded last time. So if I hit go, and then I queue up and expand my lab notebook like this, then you can see exactly what the team was asking. Like if we reallocate 20% of our X waivered appointment supply, this is a regulated type of provider license to be able to provide medication for opioid use disorder. So if they reallocate that from patients with depression to patients with opioid use disorder, and we double referrals to this program, does it increase wait times? Those are the kinds of trade-off questions teams have. And then they go through the process of setting up their experiment, adjusting their sliders, and then 
queuing up a base case for them to compare uh, this alternative against. So you can pull up any different um, alternatives after you hit run and uh, see what is most likely to lead to the least counterintended or counterproductive changes and uh, help you achieve your goal. This is a process of iteration itself where the teams go through this running a base case in session seven and then alternative after alternative from sessions eight, nine, 10 until they hopefully can find something that really works well for them. And with that, I think we are at the end of the hour. So I don't want to, um, you know, keep dragging on. Do you want to wrap us up in any way, Tom or Christine or anyone on the call? I see a comment from Kareem, for example. This is way cool. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for being here, Kareem. And the feedback, really appreciate it. No, I just want to say thank you for presenting your work. Well, thanks for having us. Um, if there's something else that anyone